Hello again. Welcome to you online, watching us uh, from wherever you are. Welcome back to Gar Maritim for another panel discussion. Um, let me point out that after this uh, session, the focal point of the new European Bauhaus Festival for the rest of the day will be moved to Mont des Arts, the Kunstberg at the heart of Brussels, where you are very welcome to more music and, um, and artistical productions to an alternative guide to, guided tour of Brussels as well, highly recommended, and um, to a discussion on sustainable future-proof fashion and design, um, fashion industry and design industry. So after this panel this, uh, session, I would say move over to Mont des Arts, uh, the Kunstberg. And of course, do not forget, you're also very welcome to engage with one another or with people who uh, were here on stage before uh, on the NEB online forum. Now, to this panel session. The digitalization opens up new frontiers, exciting prospects for indivi individuals and societies alike. I think you will all agree. But as with the Western frontier, there are always those who pay a price when unknown borders are being crossed or when new territories are conquered. So the question is how to align citizens' fundamental rights with the opportunities, known and unknown, of digital technology and data gathering? A question I'm not going to answer. I would say over to the panel and to Francesca Bria, president of the Italian National Innovation Fund and member of President von der Leyen's high-level roundtable for the new European Bauhaus. So, Ms. Bria, the floor is yours. Enjoy. Thank you, Thank you very much and uh, welcome back. Very, very happy to chair this session on Europe's technological sovereignty and what do we need on the ground to achieve the goals of the new European Bauhaus. And I think we have four great panelists for this discussion. And I'm gonna try to make it of a bit high level regarding the ideas and the mission and the objectives, but also very practical because I think Everything in the spirit of the new European Bauhaus starts from below, from the grassroots, and wants to you know, lead projects that are real, that are feasible, that have an impact in society. And uh, when we started this new European Bauhaus uh, two years ago now, when Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union addressed the need for a grassroots cultural interdisciplinary movement as the soul of the Green Deal, we all started thinking, wow, what does this mean? How this is becoming real? How this is taking shape in Europe? What are the tools? What, are, what is the new educational model? What is the thinking we need to make it real for European citizens? And I think at the end, when we will end the first wave or the second wave of the new European Bauhaus projects, citizens will be able to judge if this has worked or not worked by the impact that it made for them. And uh, also, when we think about technological sovereignty, sometimes this word is a bit abstract and we think about technology and, as, and data as something in the cloud. And I would like to try with you to make it real to to you know to try together to merge the ecological transition and the digital transition and to show the necessity for thinking together these two big transitions of our time so we have here uh, in the panel renata avila she is the ceo of the open knowledge foundation Renata has a very long uh, experience in working uh, on technology for uh, human rights and civic engagement. And she's a human rights lawyer by training. And uh, she will introduce herself well, but she has so much experience in working on technology with a broader perspective, but also really applied tools that make you know, citizens' power uh, stronger, I would say. Then we have Eddie Hartog, he's the head of unit of uh, Connect Smart Communities, um, Connect Technologies for Smart Communities in DG Connect in the European Commission. And he's leading the European Commission mission to create more than 
100 or 100 smart cities? Yeah. 112. Yeah, 112 smart cities around Europe and beyond Europe. And I think one of the things that I would like to know is not only how can smart cities really not start from technology, but from citizen needs and from, you know, these big social and environmental challenges that we are living, but also how is Europe interacting with the rest of the world in, on this topic. And then we have Michaela Magas. Michaela, she's uh, together with me, a member of President van der Leyen's Roundtable for the New European Bauhaus, has been working many, many years. I don't know with what hat do you want me to introduce anyways on the question of um, creative industries, design, technology, advising the European Commission on many different tables and uh, many uh, different um, dossier and also working with the European Parliament on those topics and with the broader design community in Europe. So I'm sure you will bring the perspective of that's the tools we already have and how we can scale them up and how we can make them to use in the new European Bauhaus context. And then we have Gerfried Stocker, the CEO of Ars Electronica Center. So Ars Electronica is one of my favorite projects in Europe <laughs> when we speak about combining arts, science and technology, maybe one of the pioneers. I think you started it all a uh, long time ago, 30 years. 43. 43 years, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, we're getting older. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. And, but yeah, a long time ago, I think you, you bet on the needs for interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity and the combination of science, technology and arts. And then if you go, you should not miss the Arts Electronica uh, Festival in Linz. What's the date this year? September 7 to 11. Yeah, September 7 to 11. And that's also where the Starts Prize will be given to, um, to amazing artists and technologists. And Starts is science for um, science and technology for, uh, for the uh, science, technology and the arts for uh, Europe uh, societal challenges. And it's a big program that DG Connect has been funded for, funding for many years. And I think now with the new European Bauhaus, we can see the importance of the STARTS work and the importance, of course, of what Starts Electro Arts Electronica has been doing for many years. So basically, we are not reinventing the wheel here. We already know what to do. But I think it's about how we make it really happening now that we have the chance because the leadership of Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the uh, European Commission, thanks to her vision and leadership, we now have the new European Bauhaus program that can help us to achieve those objectives uh, throughout Europe. So let me start with you, Renata. And the first round, I would like you to think about how you understand these questions of technological sovereignty, but in particular, linking the digital transition with the ecological crisis. So how, you know, how you, you in your work address this question of digital sovereignty and how do you see the relationship with the ecological, let's say, imperative that we have today? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself properly. My name is uh, Renata Avila, I lead the Open Knowledge Foundation. The Open Knowledge Foundation has been around almost 20 years. And it was, uh, you know, it was, I, I guess, uh, a pilot of something that can scale in a, you know, a longer list of principles if we imagine the new uh, European Bauhaus. It, it only advanced and pushed forward openness. And it really, like, uh, it is amazing if you look back in time how openness and how the concept of open knowledge now is present in each and every document of the European Commission. It's, it is installed in many governments' mentalities. It is enabling scientists to really uh, reproduce research and advance uh, public interest. It still is a lot, a lot of things to do, uh, but uh, basically a community of thinkers and doers installed a principle inside the institutions with many you know, things to be adjusted, with many things to be improved, with many mistakes of the past to be re, you know, revised. But it's there, it's there, and, and, and I, I, I will imagine that it would be one of the building principles of, the, uh, of our digital uh, new European Bauhaus. And even, um, I couldn't even imagine digital sovereignty 
without that openness. Because if, uh, if uh, you imagine, what we have today, which is an analogy that I'm using more and more and more, is uh, a building falling apart, a building that was built on principles that are failed. And that now with more and more people coming online, more and more uh, aspects of our lives being digitized, is this you know, very fragile, uh, very big and fragile and horrible building that is not uh, where people enter to it inside and is not serving them, then, you know, with closed windows, with no ways out, with securitized entrances. That's the technology that we live in today. And with a fire inside, you know, burning it because it's overheating, it's uh, poorly, like, with uh, polluted air, like, you know, all the bad things uh, of uh, these twin crises we see I I in this building that the technology is today. And to answer your question, um, what I want to do with my job and with my team that is composed by, by many Europeans, but by people from 15 nationalities, and it, it, and it expands in a broad network of uh, 40 countries working on advancing this openness. We want to advance openness and open knowledge as a design principle of the digital future we want, basically. That's our mission. And we want to demolish this crumbling building and start from scratch this new digital infrastructure that will be ours and that will be designed with principles uh, that uh, not only openness, but inclusion, sustainability, and many others that we like, you know, unpack later, uh, will reflect our times, will reflect our needs, will reflect our values, and will be this open space where everybody will feel secure, include, included, and uh, able to yeah. live a digital life of quality and responsibility. Thank you, Renata. But let me challenge you a okay. bit there also to then give the word to Eddie on this. You were saying that you would like to embed the open knowledge and the open principles on, on one side in the policy space, so in how we make how we do policy making and how we make we build uh, rules and laws um, on those sides. But also you're saying that the infrastructure is to be fixed. It's not working for what needs to work. It is a uh, walled garden, so it is, um, you know, in the hands of very few players, a bit of a monopolistic market at this point, and that we need to embed those rules, those governance rules, first of all, implement them, which is, um, you know, difficult to do sometimes, and then we need to embed those rules, which are about human rights, about openness, interoperability, and preserving civil liberties, in the technology that we use. So I think this is very challenging in the infrastructures that we build. And so um, getting back to you, because you work with hackers, I mean, you work in a kind of bottom-up way. What's the most challenging there? I mean, the implementation of the rules, because we're saying, well, we are successful, that is open everywhere, but is this openness leading to the actual implementation and transformation of infrastructures? What do we need to do differently? It is communities. Like the, the way we shape, like we have spent 20 years working with the standards, enabling tools, you know, like working, working, working on the technology part. And a little bit on the governance part, but not on the community part. Community has been neglected, and we cannot think of a new European Bauhaus without the people willing to build it. And people willing to build it, passionate about those principles. So I guess that uh, we need to study. I, I think that that's the most fascinating thing. New models to engage with our communities and really new ways to uh, continue. So it's a constant transfer of knowledge and it's con constant vigilance on keeping, uh, keeping the things principled. That was, was what it failed when openness was not uh, paired and not, it was not like, you know, um, it, it, openness alone was, didn't do the job, basically. Uh, knowledge was pushed down, kind of, and we, you can see how openness drove, like, to some extent, the crisis of misinformation. Uh, openness concentrated more power, so we need to add more last names and more uh, ally principles to make it meaningful. But without it, 
you cannot scale and you cannot impact and you, you cannot like, you know, um, rebuild and you cannot readapt to serve your local communities as well as being united in this federated, uh, uh, exciting global purpose. Yes, thank you. Uh, getting to add the end to the European Commission, I guess you have smart communities in your title or in the title of the unit. And I guess I want to challenge you on that because sometimes we have the feeling that in particular when we talk about smart cities that this really doesn't really start from the community. But it's a lot of technologies that usually the big tech companies are pushing to communities and to cities as vendors. And the cities are like this bankomat that has to buy all these technologies without having an integrated strategies and a governance model that can integrate these communities really to deliver impact, which is transforming the life of citizens. So I want to challenge you on that. How is the European Commission and Europe's vision different there? Can we really incorporate those open principles and this open source and grassroots communities that Renata is working with? And I want to add a little piece uh, to my question to you, which is now we finally, I'm actually really enthusiastic about this moment in Europe that Europe is advancing what I've been calling sometimes a constitution for the digital age, because finally we have a real agenda uh, that combines a lot of regulation that are needed to have a next generation innovation that's for the, pub the public interest. So we have the Digital Markets Act, the Digital, um, the digital um, uh, Service Act, then we have the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act, sorry, many acts, and of course the Data Protection Regulation. And all of this is a package of new rules that also tackle the question of monopolies, of uh, you know, principles that should protect civil liberties in our digital sphere, and also try to regain a little bit of power yeah, of these technology firms telling them, okay, those are the European rules. And for example, with data, data needs to you know, serve uh, the purpose of our society and not only create profit for a few companies. So we have all those regulations and some people say, how do we turn this regulation into, you know, applied rules that benefit innovation, that benefit society and not just, um, you know, more work for the lawyers that then actually benefit the big players instead of opening up the digital market? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a very good question, and the simple answer to your first question is, yes, we can. <laughs> uh, so that's the easy part. Um, but maybe three components. If you look at the technical sovereignty, I mean, I come from a technology DG, uh, split off from research or really technology driven, but there are many uh, DGs working on these smart communities, not only ours. So it's a very wide uh, package. I think you already mentioned the basic parameters of the technological sovereignty, which are partly uh, legal-based and partly finance-based, but it's about the quantum computing, it's about the, um, the CHIPS Act, it's about uh, batteries, it's, you know, a lot of these things where we basically need to make sure that we re remain a relevant player and not overrun by others. And that is not a closeness, that is openness, but in a strong position. That's really what we're trying to do. So that's the first component, but I think that's well known and it's also uh, the one I'm least involved with. And so apart from that spending and the, um, and the technology drive and, and the, 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 the thing governments could do, the second component was actually very interesting, and that's where I'm involved. It's where the cities themselves said, preparing for this current round of uh, financing, they said, it's all lovely what we do, but we never scale. We have 20 cities here and 20 cities there. And I then told them, and I had to burst the bubble, I'm sorry, Francesca, I know you worked in Barcelona, but said, in European Union, we have no big cities, actually. They're all in Asia or in the future in Africa. You talk about 10, 20 million people cities, well, name three of them. You know, we don't have them. So we need to do this together. We need to scale the solutions. And we did already a lot of good work and apps, and that's also where your uh, climate change um, uh, link comes in. A lot of good stuff for the citizens, but never with the citizens. 
And that is what we then developed, not we, it's, it's three organizations, EuroCities, the European Network of Living Labs, and the organization of Agile and Smart City, which is actually a global organization, they said. We need to scale, we need to bring basically all 86,000 mayors of the European Union in one room. Yeah? And that's possible. But we need to work from that vision into the projects, as opposed to what we used to do, have a lot of projects and then cluster them and then see whether there's a red thread that, that actually brings them together. So from that movement that is called Living in .eu, which I then was confronted with, I said, yes, we will support this. Not coming from the Commission, but both the Commission and the Committee of the Regions, very important, because it's not cities going alone, it's cities with their regions, with their member states, so all of the levels working in the same direction. I will, won't bore you with the details, we developed uh, a declaration, but a number of work strands, and two of them I think are relevant for today. One is the, the interoperability, so technical standards. Again, you can go into a lot of detail, but that's important. But also to measure, if I ask any municipality, where are you on your digital health? What's the answer? They don't know. Mm -hmm. So we did that, and, and to visualize this, it needs to be politically also relevant, because in the end, you need to have citizens in, involved. I mean, my people like to talk about data spaces and, and urban data platforms and those sort of things, but in the end, that's all lovely for engineers, but, you know, what does it do to me? We then actually came collectively to the conclusion that a good focal point is local digital twins. So uh, a, a, a meshed set of local digital twins, and then you immediately see the link to the Bauhaus when uh, this came before the Bauhaus came, and this was developed before that. And then we said, well, if you have a, a good set of data, local digital twins, virtual reality, co-design of cities, you can even go beyond uh, um, architects and artists. You're going to bring the citizens in. So you really get into that Bauhaus concept of doing that together. So that's the third component, actually, how do we deliver this? Now, then you look at, sorry, uh, commission speak of toolboxes and spaces and all those sort of instruments that we can put together. And I think yesterday the Lisbon Council announced the User-Centric Cities Award, which has gone through a library in uh, Finland. That's the, the first prize winner. But you see actually a lot of these things happening already. The question then is how do you scale them? How do you bring them together? And in that Living in .eu movement, which is not a title I invented, but it came from those uh, three organizations, we actually try to work with the cities um, on this because it's important that in the end we get the right use cases, but at scale. So anything we do is, needs to be at scale. And the funny thing is, you see how difficult it is to get Europe around one app or one technology. Uh, and as a consequence, we use the big, uh, the big apps, let's, let's, let's not name them. But once we had a problem in health, we had within six months a COVID app. Yeah. Can you imagine how powerful that is also? Now, I'm not going to focus only on apps, but how powerful a tool that can be to do a number of things. So, the possibilities are there, the willingness is there, the structure is there, now we need to start delivering it, and I think that's where the, Bau the new European Bauhaus movement can be very helpful in this. Very interesting. I want to push you a little bit on yep. two things. First of all, in the context of the new European Bauhaus, you also have the climate neutral cities. You have one of the missions that you're trying to achieve. If you can tell us a little bit, because it's always my understanding when I see the climate law, and all the Green Deal and the regulations that a lot of it, you know, when it comes to the decarbonization, uh, shifting to electric mobility, changing the way we produce and consume and live, cities have a, a, a huge role to play. And public administrations should lead this wave of green innovation or, you know, for, 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 for citizens. Sometimes they lack tools expertise, sometimes they even lack the human capacity to do that, but also those principles maybe, because you know, maybe if you need something quickly and you are in the, in the city hall, it's easier to go and just procure something instead of do procurement in a way that you integrate those rules and standards in a clever way. I mean, I do a short example. When I was in Barcelona, I started that um, you know, now it's uh, told enough around Europe is that we put 
data sovereignty clauses in public procurement contracts because we understood how data was important for planning, for decision making, for climate action, for everything. And we wanted this data to be public because the citizens were paying for the service. So we said, okay, the data should be given back to the municipality, the data that we, of the services we procure in machine readable format. And we have to consider that data a public good, then we have to protect it because we have to protect privacy and security and ethics and so on. But then we can also open it up for startups, for civic innovators, for data journalists, for, you know, and then we can build next generation services in healthcare, mobility, education, and so on. How do we manage to integrate those smart standards and services and scale them up in Europe? And I finished my long question by saying I was uh, talking to your general director, um, Roberto Viola, a few days ago, and he showed us a fantastic plan. I think we have to actually do it, which is, was about certain digital public infrastructures that we need to build in Europe. Our digital ID, which is a digital wallet with cryptography, attribute-based cryptography so we can control our ID and our data. And it's like, you cannot, if you are a citizen in the digital age, you cannot be an Apple, Facebook, or Google citizen. You're going to be a European citizen. And then you're going to interact in a way that you can control this data. And then we're going to have this, no, now we have the digital um, COVID certificate. And we're going to have a payment system, maybe with even a digital euro and lots of services. And these are going to be many of those smart city services you work on. So just to make it short, we, how do we get to this yep. vision scalable for all European citizens with robust public digital infrastructure? There are probably about 50 elements in your question, uh, Francesca, <laughs> but let me focus on two. Let me focus on two. <laughs> what, nobody is right. One is, uh, how do you get that leverage? What you, you, you mentioned what you did in uh, Barcelona, but try to do that on behalf of Vilvoorde. Or try to do that on behalf of The Build, which is a small city in, in Utrecht. So that is also why the, the, my label, the only thing I could change when I got this new unit was to change from smart cities to smart communities. Because you have sub-entities within cities, because everyone in the tourist areas, we all have Wi-Fi and that sort of stuff. But try to do that in, let's say, certain other parts of bigger cities where there are many visitors coming, let's put it that way. You know, we don't have that. But also rural areas. There's, I, I have in the Living in Dr. Your Movement, there's one um, um, community, Dingelstedt in Germany, 6,000 inhabitants. They should also be able to take part. And they even have a bigger problem than the Barcelonas and the Amsterdams and the Stockholm. So we want to bring them on board. And that is why through the movement, we work on what we call minimum interoperability mechanisms. Because it's easy to say for the commission, you know, guys, what we do, one standard, you all do that, that's it. But, well, try to find the one. That's the, but that's not how it works. And the minimum interoperability mechanisms also have something on fair AI, so the European values. How do we want to have, deal with AI? How do we want to deal with data? So that's the first component. How do you scale that? Through the movement, we try to get similarities which would allow clusters of municipalities to actually do the procurement together. It requires planning and stuff, but, but you know, that you get a scale of procurement and that you get the negotiation power that you had in Barcelona on, on the data, because not everyone has that. So that's one element. The second element is the, the sector, the, the link between climate change and uh, the green transition and the digital transition. Well, I'm, my president had the 10 priorities and uh, the, the reference was always to the green and digital twin transition, and we really see them together. On the one hand, make sure that we use the digital elements into the greening. So there's a lot of things you can do by being, having better uh, virtual reality, better uh, um, um, uh, simulation and, and th those sort of things which help you in the climate change. But also to make sure when you invest in all these big things, the chips and uh, quantum computing and all these things, that they actually are green from the outset and not sort of as an afterthought. So those are the things that we need to work on. And by the way, the, the mission originally, well, it still is called the climate, uh, climate Neutral and Smart Cities Mission. Now, I know it focuses on the climate uh, element, but we will try to work with not only the 112 cities that have in the end been selected there, because we as a commission have said, 
all the others that apply, but even beyond that, which we call it the onion rings, we need to work with everyone actually in this. So we try to also work on a digital roadmap that will help them in that climate uh, ch uh, change uh, um, adaptation and mitigation effect. So we, we really make that link. Uh, it's digital with a purpose. Thank you. So this is a very good transition to Michaela because um, I wanted to ask you something related to the tools that we have for the new European Bauhaus. And just let me, um, I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you do, when we had a meeting with President van der Leyen within the uh, high level roundtable of the NAB, and then uh, Breton, the commissioner, uh, the commissioner for digital agenda, space, um, technology, and a lot of other things, <laughs> was there with us. And we were talking about an idea to create the data space for the new European Bauhaus. And he was like, we are going to make this happen. Yes? So he made a promise because we were thinking, okay, we really need data to measure everything we do, to mobilize creativity. This data has to be governed in a, in a very European and specific way. And, but what tools do we need to make this happen? Michaela, how, where would you start and what systems and technologies we have to do this? So, so um, this is of course a key question really. Um, and it's about joining the dots to begin with. So it's not just what tools do we have and what do we do with them. It's that who do we have available and who are the communities that we can uh, use to test drive those tools. So I have been uh, feeding policy directly from grassroots creative experimentation for the past 10 years. So literally from the ground up, testing things with communities, um, starting from you know 10 years ago, established something called Music Tech Fest when there was a uh, an industry that was nose diving, literally because it had to transition to the digital so fast that they were really lost in terms of how they should now, you know, the whole industry had transferred over to the data space. And it was really a fantastic pilot for other industries to actually play with their data, to play with the potential business models and to engage communities. And of course, music is a wonderful social glue. This is where culture and creativity are, are a fantastic uh, thing to include in those experimental environments because they really fuel the space for experimentation. And everything that we have fed through in terms of innovation recommendations directly to the um, uh, Horizon program uh, has been uh, literally based on tangible results on the ground. And so, so this is kind of evidence-based policy that you can create, and it's very NEB. This is very New European Bauhaus. It's about we engage communities on the ground to prototype with the tools to use cultural creativity and then join the disciplines together. So I specialized in creating spaces for common understanding and looking at what tools do we need to create common understanding between various different disciplines because it was clear from the beginning we needed all the disciplines uh, to join forces as well as academia and industry in the space of common understanding. And this uh, has actually translated into initiatives such as the industry commons on one side where we now build tools across industry sectors, so tools for interoperability uh, with industry, where uh, basically uh, what we are looking at is not just interoperability in strict technical terms, it's not just about how do you link the two sort of sides of data sets from the different domains together, but how do you actually extract, or how do you actually make it meaningful? And so for instance, our first step was to, do, to look at creating an ontology ecosystem. How do you manage, how do you manage relationships between meanings and semantics? Um, that's on, on the industry side, so we work with, you know, uh, Airbus, Bosch, Siemens, you name it, and now more recently also with IKEA and those kinds of companies in this, in this cross-domain interoperability data space. The other side of it is, of course, working directly with the communities, creating enabling tools with the communities on the ground to be able to scale the best practice from the ground directly up into, into policy. So this real tangible evidence-based policy. And there we have discovered that it is incredibly fruitful because industry actually came into that space. They asked us to come into that space because they realized that some of the things that were happening in terms of us creating knowledge exchange, uh, tools that were enabling knowledge exchange between different sort of stakeholders were really, really um, useful in terms of um, uh, being able to uh, test drive what the industry want to test. I mean, it's really difficult for industry industry to uh, grapple with some of the frontier technologies that they're having to implement. So these are providing really good test beds. 
And within these uh, uh, communities, what's really interesting when you work with cities, so you work in, in situ, with sit, in city environments or in environments that are, for instance, wetlands in Europe, you embed these communities in real space, they are facing real challenges on the ground and they are responding to those. Um, what's really interesting is as soon as you give enabling tools to communities, they take over. You know, we, if you speak to city councils, if you speak to um, regional municipalities, if you ask them, what do you do with data with people? They say, well, we collect data from people or we disseminate information. The truth is they take over immediately as soon as you give them tools. And what is really incredible is that immediately you spot new virtuosities with the new systems that they set out. This is so important for the future of work, for example, to actually pinpoint what are our new practices um, not only in terms of governance, self-governance, but also in terms of what uh, people's talents can... I mean, you know, to illustrate this point, it's something really simple. Before, you know, a piano is a piece of technology. Before there was a piano, you couldn't have a pianist, virtuoso. It didn't exist, right? So it works like that with all the systems that we set up on the ground. So in terms of the systems that we set up, you know, if, if we want to now scale this to the, uh, to the new European Bauhaus, data space based on the principle that we're going to be prototyping hopefully with the help of of course committee of the regions interreg europe and all the uh, and cohesion funds and everybody who's on board of this across all of the regions we want to run european Bauhaus across communities everywhere in europe get them to prototype on the ground include everybody to tackle their local challenges our attitude to this is the center has moved to the periphery or rather the periphery is the new center this is where our frontier is to tackle the the Green Deal challenges. If we're doing that, we need to construct the technological space that's completely embedded in the local culture. And actually, the you know data doesn't exist just in the nodes and synapses where you just kind of collect your, your data points. It, it's completely permeable. It's embedded in culture, culture's embedded in data. So you need to actually be thinking of this as, as one and the same thing. So we, we are actually building a series of enabling mechanisms for this. So, what needs to happen in order for the innovation space to exist, for the creation space to exist. Systems of agreements, so of course regulation, you mentioned regulation, embedded in the system as an enabler, but also systems to track intellectual property because what we want to do is make sure that each contributor in the co-creation space is actually, uh, it has attribution so they can track it and trace it mm -hmm. in, in the chain. Um, systems of um, uh, resilience so that you can, you can, for instance, if you're following Kate Rowworth's uh, donut economy model, that you don't uh, exceed the maximum allowable for sustainability so that you can actually monitor that. Systems of responsibility so that you embed responsible AI, corporate social responsibility, data ethics. And then there's a foundation, of course, systems of beliefs, which is our societal, our cultural systems, where we actually want to make sure that, for instance, radical inclusion, both in terms of multi-gender, um, uh, cross-generational, uh, uh, beyond human ecosystems, are actually all part of this space. So uh, there are foundational enabling mechanisms that need to be embedded. The data doesn't exist in a, in a vacuum. It exists inside the whole ecosystem, ecosystem of uh, culture and society. Yeah, that's um, absolutely brilliant. I want to get back to you on two things. Um, one thing is if you, get, if you can be more specific about the kind of tools, in particular data tools that mm -hmm. we need for the climate, uh, I mean, yeah. for the climate challenge, in particular decarbonization and CO2 emissions, and the fact that we always say in the NAB that we don't only have to become climate neutral. I mean, actually, this has passed now in the European Parliament that Europe is going to be climate neutral by uh, 2050, and we're going to have to cut our emissions by 55% by uh, 2035. So this is a big is a big challenge. And we always say, not only climate neutrality, we have to be climate positive, we, because we have to take out you know, this um, CO2, and so we need ways to do that. Mm -hmm. So can you be more specific yeah, about absolutely. the tools we have there? And in particular, um, more than 70% of CO2 emission is created by the construction industry. So Absolutely. maybe there's something we can do in mm -hmm. the built environment. And then finally, who do we need on this table if we want to kick off the, the data space for the NAB? Mm. Who do we bring together? So 
in terms of this top layer then, when we innovate, um, and obviously subject to solving interoperability, we, are, we need to work across domains. It's absolutely necessary. But not only because of that, because all of your supply networks are now strongly intertwined and we have all uh, witnessed it during the pandemic really strongly that, you know, it's not just a linear process anymore where your material or your goods are dispensed. It's actually massively interlinked with all kinds of uh, other domains and services. So in order to bridge all of those, uh, we really need, obviously we solve interoperability, we need to be able to track and trace the a life cycle, full life cycle of materials and products across this. And of course, here is where these systems of uh, common understanding are incredibly important because we need to be able to get this right. We need to be able to follow it right through over to where it's being deployed, how it's being disposed of, how it's being reused, repurposed, etc. So these systems for um, tracking and tracing the life cycle are really very much a priority. There are several projects currently that are working on those in various different domains separately and some in domains across. I have already mentioned in Ontocommerce we're creating a, systems, a system for um, ontology, or basically an ontology ecosystem where we look at how we can understand each other across domains. But there are also projects, for instance, devoted, uh, like the Basajaun project is devoted to tracing, for instance, the life cycle of wood in particular. Yes. Uh, and this has now been brought into the auto commons. You know, we are kind of trying to all work together on this. There is there's other, another aspect where we can actually really um, uh, do it in a very practical manner. Uh, as you probably, um, as many people who work with data are aware, one of the biggest paradigms is fair data, fair data exchanges. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. You actually think about what that means. That's actually looking at the practical way in which you connect or find things. So it's, it's actually technical implementation. What we have then introduced into EOSC, and it's now passed as a recommendation to connect, is uh, to counterpose FAIR with just data annotation. So, because we said there's a human responsibility that's involved, and there is a responsibility of the data user and researcher to look, to actually aim to be judicious, unbiased, safe, and transparent. And the idea is that every data set, when the, the, the trouble is, you know, when the data sets are created, they're created usually with one group of people in one country, with, uh, so of a, with people of a certain age. There is no such thing as unbiased data set. Every data set has got a bias. Now, the problem is with the computer scientists, so they are looking at valorization of data or extracting meaning. They are not thinking of provenance. And so the trouble is that those data sets are not a universal truth. We need to actually be absolutely sure that we know or we need to try and annotate as much as possible what is the context that, context that this data has been generated. If you follow, for instance, Joy Bulomini's work on, on uh, uh, data bias, you will realize that the implications are huge. So basically what we need to then do is the next person who inherits that information can actually assess whether it's suitable for the user context and they can add their own assessment, their own annotation as to how this data behaves in that context and whether it is affecting privacy issues, whether it is judicious enough or whether it is particularly uh, biased in that context. So this is, for instance, a simple practice that we can implement between us very, very fast and it would actually create a knowledge pool that is building constantly in terms of assessing how, um, as I say, just our data is in terms of how we interact with it as humans. I think this is a kind of a program where we can really start to shape this um, data space for the new European Bauhaus. Uh, Gerfried, I want to get to you. Um, well, Michaela has been talking a lot about this method, this almost like this kind of um, new educational method that we need, which is underpinning the new European Bauhaus. And in the previous panel with Ram Kulhas and um, and uh, Hobrist, when we were discussing, you know, this kind of data center, democratic data center, and the town hall, I was thinking about Ars Electronica as an example a little bit. It has some of those features. And all the times when I come to Ars Electronica, I think the center that you have in Linz, i always thinking every city should have a space like this. Every city, it should be everywhere. Why, and in particular with your latest uh, artificial intelligence exhibition, which is open to the public, because every citizen can get in there, see an exhibition about technology, arts, and science, really important 
pieces of work, but also have a conversation about what it means, understanding the basic of the functioning, you know, get really get a knowledge about this technology and then experience them in the lab. And you have a, a lot of example also in bringing together scientists with artists and you know what and with technologists as well and you've been you know running you know residencies and laboratories and academies for many years with the stars project and not only so you know what works and what doesn't so what can we take from this arts electronic approach for the new european bauhaus and scale how do we scale arts electronica <laughs> <laughs> can we Yes, of course we can. <laughs> I fully agree. And uh, we have so much evidence now in Europe that we actually can. I mean, who would have thought that uh, 10 years ago that we would have such an important role on a global scale as Europe leading to something like a constitution of the digital age and the digital society, as you mentioned it. I mean, until 10 years ago, Europe, the official Europe on the nation level as well as, of course, in the Commission, was basically sleeping away on digitalization or at least on digital transformation. They understood it's necessary to have engineers and engineers and engineers <laughs> because this is what the industry told them. And this was the only people, they were uh, obviously listening. But now, 10 years later, Europe really has taken over the leading role and is a beacon internationally in terms of taking a serious uh, uh, awareness and also taking a serious role in providing an environment that is competitive on the one side for the economy, but even more so that is really in a fair and justice way taking into account that it's actually about us people who have to live in this digital world and who want to live in the digital world and who should have the best uh, conditions for it. And I think uh, in terms of how can we scale it, and you said, you know, uh, you know what's, what works and doesn't work. I mean, of course, the first answer would be every time you think you know what works, forget it and start to rethink it again, because it's still uh, an area where we are in constant development. I mean, the things are changing so fast and not just in the way as we uh, were thinking of in the last decades. We were, when we said things are changing fast, everybody meant technology is changing fast. But now we recognize technology isn't changing at all in so many places. It's just a new marketing iteration of the same gadget. So uh, the changes are now really in the social and cultural domain. And this is why we need to really, in a very serious way, start with new alliances. It's no longer enough to just talk about interdisciplinarity at the opening of events and then at the end every discipline, every group of experts is still pursuing their own direction. And only when they hit the obstacle, they said, ah, maybe you can help me. And then what do they mean with helping? You know, just help me around, uh, above the, the obstacle and then I run uh, along on my own. So we need also on the institutional level, really going into politics and, 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 and governance, we need a, a real serious commitment to interdisciplinarity and the, and the new type of alliances. And this is probably the best example that we can learn from Ars Electronica, because I said it, it's, it's really 43 years ago, 1979. This was before the personal computer hit the market. This was before CD players came to the market. A journalist, an artist and a scientist came together and invented Ars Electronica, and they gave it the title Festival for Art, Technology and Society. And I'm always joking that maybe they just couldn't come to terms because they had so different ideas what to make. And at the end they said, oh my God, you know, just uh, let's call it all three and, and we are fine. But well, this is already a kind of commitment. And it was in the beginning something that was really like being the bastard between the chairs. But the great thing is from being between the chairs, you can build up your own position. And I think this is really one of the great possibilities for Europe right now. And when it comes to sovereignty, I mean, we have been talking a lot about kind of infrastructures and also, of course, the regulations, which are very important. But in this question, I think one very important, is all, uh, important thing is always not only to ask for possibilities, you know, like allow me to be sovereign or give me the infrastructure to be sovereign. It's really also working on your ability to participate. 
And this is not just in terms of, oh, nice, you know, make me able to do it. It's really the commitment to take over responsibility. It's not just being, you know, in a cool position and now I'm the big player. But it's really uh, uh, um, this uh, very important role of responsibility. And I think this is something for individuals as well as we think uh, of uh, Europe uh, at large again. And um, I think a very interesting point here can really, or has to be, of course, uh, to um, think of this not from a... Uh, introvert, introspective position. I mean, this is the very big danger that we have right now, uh, that, okay, now everything becomes Europe. And, you know, great, we have our own glass bubble that protects us against these enemies out there and against these digital landlords from Google and, and so on. The only way to, to uh, make any progress in this is, of course, a very serious, large-scale international networking and, and collaboration. Because otherwise we won't be able to come up with all the expertise that we need. And otherwise we won't be able to play this very big role of being the beacon, being you know, the best possible example of how to, how to lead into the digital world uh, for the rest of, of this globe. And in particular, of course, when it comes to the, to the real big problem of all this, uh, this is how to fuel all these wonderful data centers that we are going to build. How are we actually planning all these wonderful chip factories that we are now planning in Europe? I mean, we cannot just repeat the way how they have been built in the last uh, few decades in Asia and the United States, because there won't be just enough uh, CO2 budget to run these centers. So this is an incredible challenge, but at the same time, of course, the really big economic and, and competitional uh, chance and opportunity that Europe has, we have to reinvent actually the digital industry. And this is really a great thing and we can only do it, of course, by utilizing every possible expertise that we can get. I want to make you a question on this. Um, you are doing a lot of work um, because obviously the engineer would say, well, of course, the answer is going to be quantum. <laughs> Right, uh, maybe or fusion, or I mean, anyways, uh, yes, maybe a part is going to be a technologic or scientific answer, but that's not what you're saying. You you say we need to reinvent the industry, but we also need to reinvent the way we, um, you know, from the educational side, we bring together different talents in a multidisciplinary way to discover new possibilities for this technology that answer to the societal challenges. So I know that you're working on a big project on that. This kind, and you have it in Ars Electronica every year, experiments with students that are always super interesting to see how students react, what students yeah. do. So can you tell us a little bit, because this was at the, at the very basis of the Bauhaus initially, mm -hmm. yeah. where it was a new educational method, a new, a new school, let's yeah. say, that they didn't want yeah. to be called the school. Yeah. So can Maybe you just to make some use of this wonderful high tech that you have, <laughs> maybe the technicians can play a little bit of this uh, video that I brought along, just an illustration. The project that you are talking about is called Festival University and it's not just uh, another way to involve some students in your festival or to, to make a summer school. It's really a long-term uh, project and development that actually will lead to a new type of university. The uh, Austrian federal government two years ago announced that they will build a new and found a new university for digital transformation. And of course, there were all the informatics and computer scientists, people saying, okay, this is us. And then there were all the industry guys and said, yeah, finally, but we need, you know, like 500 engineers every year, so please deliver them. So they think more or less of a factory for experts. And then there is small, small, small little Ars Electronica that is trying to, to hold against it and tries to really create the understanding that in particular digital transformation is so much more than just digitalization. This is really the next step. And we need to think of this in a global scale. So Festival University is a project where we uh, last year invited 100 uh, students from all over the world, from Lebanon, from India, from Sri Lanka, but also, of course, here from the rich European countries, from totally diverse areas, computer science uh, uh, students as well as art students, uh, also younger people who are not yet in university. And for four weeks, we were 
bringing them together, giving them opportunity to meet experts uh, like you and many others of uh, us Electronica, but also the scientists of the university to explore together possibilities. And the question was, transform your world. And of course, the most important thing was that your world is completely different for the young woman that came from Lebanon than, of course, the guys from Germany, Austria, and so on. This year, we already have 200 students and even longer period. And now the next step will be that it's going to be a full semester and really become a kind of permanent part of this new type of uh, university. This is very Bauhaus, you know that. Um, I want to get to Renata with this thing. It's, it's so many times in the panel before, in this panel, we start thinking about systems, infrastructures, rules, governance, technology, and then we end up saying, we need a new type of institution. We need an institutional change. We need to transform society. A big question around governance, of course, where you started from. You started saying, we are building governance structures based on openness with communities and embed the human values in it. But I also want to ask you, because you worked a lot on digital colonialism. And I want you to really get your opinion on this, not to be European-centric in this conversation. How do we move beyond? Because, you know, otherwise you are going to say <laughs> we're going to be all in a kind of digital colony. <laughs> and uh, what's, well, what's your yeah, take? Yeah, we need, like, uh, you know, like when, when, when you all were telling all these be beautiful things and all the amazing things that Europe will do, you know, like the, trage the tragedy is that it will hit a wall. It will hit the European wall of this fortress. Because your rules and your go governance, all the benefit for, uh, by Europeans for Europeans and to the rest of the world, good luck, you know. We have seen it with the vaccines. We have seen, like, you know, with uh, a, an IP system, a closed knowledge system that will never allow me in the Global South to copy, to adapt, to accelerate the process of the technologies that we need on a global scale. I mean, you can fix, you can fix uh, the, the environmental problem here, uh, the digital problem here. The ship is still going to sink. The building is still going to fall apart if we don't radically change, radically change the, the way that global norms are made. And the way that global norms are made right now is Big, rich countries bullying, bullying, basically, uh, small uh, countries to adopt uh, rules that are not necessarily uh, taking into consideration these possibilities of a new world, you know, mining industry, for example, where are all these, where, where is the lithium, lithium coming from? Um, exploitation, you know, like it's, it's great to have 100 students. Imagine if I cannot even if the journals are closed and if, if we cannot share, if the patents of uh, environmentally uh, friendly technologies only belong to European companies. So how can we make sure that this conversation matters also for places in the global south? Where we, would you start from? Uh, let's make, uh, let's uh, start making the new European Bauhaus the exception and all the projects around it like radically open and with a radical open knowledge component. And let's make that the exception will be so successful that it will, it, will, it will become the rule, maybe starting by 112 cities and then expanding beyond. Thank you. On, yeah. on that point, because I, my previous job was head of the international unit of DG Connect, so this very much resonates with me. So immediately when I saw my colleagues doing all this smart city stuff and sort of the introverted way of doing that, I said, well, wait a minute. So we have already done, and we already have some successes. So we immediately reached out to G20. Are these the same principles that you like? Resonates with Japan and South Korea. Next week, I will be doing a European Union side event in the World Urban Forum, where we will bring this. I've had various conversations with Africans, for example, um, already. Um, the Living in .eu movement that I mentioned is the only uh, Euro European Union example mentioned in the second quarterly report of the UN Habitat. So, you know, we try, I, from the outset, I've said we need to bring this philosophy in because it's actually, the, the sovereignty is not, like you said it in the first panel, it's not about 
you know, putting fences around them, fortresses. It's about keeping the control over your own living environment while being part of a global context. I think you've had various panels there. So we've done that actually from the outset. And I find that it resonates with a lot of the countries that I meet, that they say, yeah, we would like something like this now. That's not a copy and paste because it needs to be embedded in their cultures, in their way of working, in their way of thinking, in their values, etc. But it is something that very much resonates. And we as the European Commission have started to work on that conceptually, but also very operationally. I've put my people on the standards work because I often discovered that after 10 years of work, I was discovered with, uh, confronted with something that I had to say yes or no to. And the answer would have had to be no because it's not where we wanted to go. Yeah, Michele. So just just very very briefly, I mean, to 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 follow up on that, um, actually, this doesn't so, definitely beyond European, definitely beyond human. Um, you know, we definitely need to have an ecosystemic approach to to, to this. It doesn't stop us from modelling things in Europe and actually creating models that can be ported over to other places in the world. Uh, and this is something that's been starting so to be demonstrated. This is very important. Let me say, yesterday in the opening uh, panel uh, for the new European Bauhaus Festival, Ursula von der Leyen and Francis Kere had a dialogue from Rome. And he said, Francis Kere, he said, if you are doing it right, Africa will cop mm -hmm. it. If you're doing it wrong, Africa will cop it. So you must do it but right. But this, I think this doesn't apply just to Africa. I mean, I quote, I kind of misquoted him by saying they will copy. Because actually, it's not just Africa. A lot of people will copy. If you do it right, if you don't do it right, they will still copy. So it's actually, there is, there, it, it, but it requires courage to do it right. And also it requires us to experiment and see what's right, not just to assume what's right. So this is where when we, when we experiment, we prototype on the ground, when we use the new European Bauhaus principle to actually be hands-on with communities, feed the policy right from the ground up. We can actually see what is the best practice and look at what the, the models that will can then be ported over, scaled up and actually ported over to other parts also. I mean, and not in terms of, not, certainly not in colonial tools, just in terms of principles. Because that the way, okay, I think we are, get, you want to say the final last word, the yeah, final it's, word with the music? It's not about exporting Europe. Listen and look to what they have to propose to us. Absolutely, which was the question of not colonialism, yeah. going beyond and doing it together. So thank you very much. This was the last panel of the day. I think we're doing great with the new European Bauhaus Festival. Thanks for everybody watching online. See you tomorrow at 9. Thank you. Thank you.